Hi, I'm Eli Roth, director of the motion picture Cabin uh, Fever. Uh, what you're watching is a behind-the-scenes documentary. Here's where all the movie magic happens. Enjoy. Action! I think people are going to be really disturbed by the movie. I think the movie is going to be just, just disgusting, absolutely disgusting. Okay. This is why I'm doing this. <laughs> Well, we knew that Eli would make a horror film the day he vomited while watching Alien. What would you say is your son's obsession with horror films? I just explained it. Oh, shit, I missed it. You missed it all. Watch away for the DVD. I've been shooting horror films since I was eight years old. I had a Super 8 camera, and I would make my brothers uh, cover themselves in ketchup while I had ruined my father's power tools. I originally got the idea for the film when I was in Iceland, where I was working on a horse farm and I got a skin infection. My skin basically began to eat itself, and one day I woke up and I was shaving, and I started shaving and I peeled off layers and layers and layers of my face. So I began to learn very quickly about flesh-eating viruses and different skin infections. It's definitely more horrifying than your standard horror movie because, because there's so much truth to it. looking to do genre pictures, um, something that was more commercial than some of the independent films we'd done, um, but they were also intelligent. They weren't just gratuitous sex and violence and uh, nudity, even though we all like that. This is a horror movie that pays its homage to horror movies before it, and very famous ones, but at the same time adds something very interesting, which is the fact, and different, which is the fact that it's a virus movie. What attracted me to the script was the fact that it was totally grotesque and gory and it made me sick. It's the flesh eating virus, but it's really each other and like the, um, not even like the town folk, it's, it's like the attitudes that everyone like comes up with. The scariest part of the script is the fact that these kids turn on each other. Um, there's all these horrible things going on, but if they really knew how to deal with it, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Okay. Alright, so, so slow down. So when you throw him down, just give him, let him do the fall, because okay. we don't want to break yeah. him any more than we already have. Yeah. And when you kick him, don't kick him, because then he'll go crazy and throw you through the window, and then you get decapitated and we won't be able to shoot scene 63. You always try to find the person that's just right for every role, but you never know how they're all going to interact. All five of us mesh really well together. And it's, We've all bonded um, similar to how our characters do. Serena is, uh, she's really, you know, very pretty, and I think that she's doing a great job in the film. It is easy to do our relationship scenes on camera because we've become good friends off camera. Joey um, really thinks ahead, and, and uh, for instance, we have the scene where he, he just came up, he really wanted to have a handkerchief to um, be afraid of being infected, and so during a scene with his girlfriend, he's yeah. covering his mouth, and it's something like that is so good. Jordan is incredible. She and I have, uh, as actors, really grown together, and it's a lot of fun because she's incredibly talented. Ryder is great. He's smart, and, and, and he's, a, he's definitely a veteran, and he's doing it for a long time. I grew up watching him on Boy Meets World, so it's fun to work with him. Jimmy is great to work with for me because he's so spontaneous, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't really hesitate to just try something new. If you look up in the dictionary the textbook of professionalism, it will be a photograph of James DiBello. Do do do, fucking me in the ass. Do do do. Jimmy, action. Yeah, you ready? All right. Do, do, do. All right. So me in the ass. And action. We didn't have any prima donnas on the set. Everybody, uh, you know, got covered in blood. Was getting beat up. I can't imagine finding a better cast than what we put together for Cabin Fever.
I feel that horror movies today don't have some of the elements of my favorite old school movies. They don't have the zooms, they don't have the grain, they don't have the dark look. The look of Cabin Fever, um, you know, goes through a progression from, uh, from light to dark throughout the entire film. And it's done in a very gradual way and hopefully in a way that's, you know, not perceptible as you're watching it, but just sort of subconsciously draws you in. There's a different level of silver left in on each different reel. And it was designed to progressively get darker and darker as the movie progresses and increase the contrast. Also, the silver retention desaturates some of the colors uh, more in line with the film stocks uh, of the 70s. As it takes on this sort of hyper-real uh, contrast, hyper-real grain, uh, we also started to stylize things a little more. And then we go into the hospital and, you know, there we left the fluorescence uncorrected so that it would give a green, very sickly feeling. Eli and I spent a great deal of time uh, before we shot the movie uh, discussing everything from color schemes to looking at Francis Bacon pictures to uh, watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre to, you know, sharing a cabin, you know, for two weeks in pre-production. Sometimes people watch the movie and they say to me, was that the same cabin in Evil Dead? Well, no, it wasn't because that one was burnt to the ground. But to me, that's, that's like the highest compliment you can get. He wanted his film to be really, really layered and uh, to have a sense of, of um, backstory behind all of the different images that he wanted. It might not even be picked up by the viewer, but it would still be there. We don't want to just make a box. It's too easy to do that. We want everything falling into shadows. And when I saw Franco's design, it was like exactly what I had had in my head. It was beautiful. We looked at the colors, we looked at Francis Bacon paintings, he brought me different books of cabins, and we said, this is the mood, this is the feel. And we didn't want anything to look like a set. We wanted it to all feel like it was a real environment. In designing the cabin, I really wanted to create a, one impression when they first walked in, and the deeper into the story, the more you begin to uh, see uh, textures um, in the cabin that you hadn't seen before. You are in a cabin and there is this sense of claustrophobia. I didn't want it to be boring because it's a tiny, tiny set. So I wanted to make, to just throw every texture I possibly knew that could be a part of the theme of a log cabin. You know, rotting wood, logs. We created a fake rock that had to look real. There's a story to the cabin. We don't know where it is or when it was built. And somehow you know that there's been in previous inhabitants, people that have put up wall murals that have faded in the bedrooms. I kind of wanted to, to not look like a cheesy horror film. I wanted it to be subtle, really, really subtle and dramatic. Eli and I and David Lynch have been friends for a long time. And um, Eli and I both were in Cannes a few years ago for the premiere of Mulholland Drive. And there was a party afterwards, and Eli came to me and said, Angelo, I am, I am starting to develop a, a movie, and I, I, I would just love if you, know, you would agree to, to help me out and do some music for it. And I had said, Eli, you know, you don't have to say a word, man. I said, you've got it. I told Eli I would create some themes for him, and one of them was the love theme, or the red love theme, or the red love blood theme, and or sometimes called the uh, finger bang misfire.
and the thought was for me just to create these themes and put them in some kind of form and get them out to Eli and if he thought that was great boom then get them out to Nathan Barr uh, who's, co who's doing the score and composing the score My musical influences on Cabin Fever were the same uh, as Eli's influences, probably, as a filmmaker. Uh, we both are great fans of uh, sort of 70s, 80s horror films. We knew that we wanted something along those lines in terms of the score. One of the things Eli and I experimented with uh, was musical effects that were almost sound effects. And we did that, for example, in the opening titles, uh, where there's, you can't really tell if it's sound effects, is it musical effects, what is it, it's sort of... Uh, it takes on this other completely eerie quality. One of the most important things about this movie is that the effects had to look great. They couldn't just be good, they had to be great. Garrett Immel is the greatest. He's our effects artist. When we're talking, we speak to each other in film reference languages. Like, well, the screwdriver in the ear, oh, that's the Dawn of the Dead scene. That's Garrett. Come on. I remember describing to the KMB guys what I wanted. I said, this girl has to be the most beautiful girl. And by the end of the movie, actually about halfway into the movie, she's totally rotted. She's almost like a living skeleton, kind of like the Evil Dead 2 poster. I mean, she just looked creepy. It was not her. Eli's a great director. He loves the gore. He thinks I look pretty with blood all over my face. It's wonderful to work with girls that are not afraid to completely put themselves out there and look horrible and deformed. Serena, Vincent, and Jordan Ladd are two of the most beautiful girls on the planet. And I apologize to them, I say, I'm sorry guys, I have to cover you in blood, I have to cover you in this horrible flesh-eating virus, and they love it, they're totally game for it. It's not very comfortable. it on, Glop it on, cover them. All right, you just like, you know. Oh, <laughs> I have so much fun with this. You were running, uh, uh, cl close, close up on the legs. Screaming. Right? Yeah, and we see the legs, and then we're going to go you into the shed. Okay. Hang it here. Okay. It's going to be pretty intense. Okay. It's going to be one of those hard moving moments. You'd actually be a good coach. Really? Yeah. You mean like Little League coach? Or... That too. <laughs> I wanted a great death for Jeff because he's such a dick in the movie. Don't fucking come near me! Jeff! Stop! Stop! I don't want to get sick. I don't want any of us getting sick. But you two fucking fuckers insist on touching her. And now she's bleeding all over both of you guys. So you two can fucking rot. But not me. No fucking way. Not me. We rigged him up with these squibs. And you know, the, the squibs, when you get shot with them, the squibs are sometimes hot. And Joey was such a sport. He's like, bring it on. It's a good day to die. What I wanted to do, Eli won't let me. I wanted to have blood on my handkerchief. And then when I die, bring the handkerchief up to my nose. And then, like, as I fall, like, blood smears across my face. But the director's not good. It's too much. Picture's gonna be up in just a second. We got 20 squib hits. Lots of blood. <laughs> flying everywhere. Gonna I'm gonna jump. take a picture. Die. I made it! I For Bert's head explosion, I wanted a good effect. And uh, Mike Shore, who was doing a lot of our practical, he was doing uh, some of the fire effects, had an air mortar. So Mike and Garrett Immel to show me this demonstration. They're like, well, how does this look? And they took probably about a grapefruit size worth of blood and gut. All right, here we go. What? <laughs> I think it's just gonna look sick and fantastic. Beautiful. Can I press the button to blow out my own head? Good night, fucker. Maybe a little high. Best part of the whole movie.
most fun I had the whole time. I didn't know, I didn't know Bert had that many much brains. Yeah. <laughs> Something I didn't realize about uh, the blood that we use, which was caro syrup and food coloring, uh, is that it actually does coagulate in the cold. And poor Ryder Strong, we covered the guy head to toe in caro syrup, because the last 30 minutes of the movie, he's just completely covered in blood. Before each take, you want it to look fresh. So if it was all crackly, we'd just have to kind of juice him up before every take. And out in that 40 degree cold, I thought, well, it's gonna be cold, we should put him in a wetsuit to keep him warm. And the blood went between his skin and the wetsuit and stuck to his skin. He told me for three days he was picking blood out of his hair and his ears. He said that blood got everywhere. It's actually not that cold out. It's just, I, mean, I don't think it is. No. Well, it's yeah, annoying. it's freezing. Oh, okay. So it doesn't concern you that I have a character thinking he's fingering a girl, but actually digging into the flesh in her inner thigh. I miss that part. Why do I miss all the good parts? <laughs> Wheels turning, some of the leaves are turning brown. This is when uh, Paul um, goes for my crotch, as he likes to call it, and he's surprised with the results. But this one's kind of cool. This is like, oh, he's got a little chunk. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Now that tastes like a hand. After the day glows come over you. Oh, that looks great. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. Then we should be brighter here. Yeah, let's give his hand a good one. So I should look like that. I'm sorry. Two finger action. Two finger action. Yeah, you're just you're just single. <laughs> you weren't going double barrel. I wasn't going double barrel yet. No. It was very difficult to resist tempting, you know, just lots and lots of shots of the fingering going in there. But, you know, I think with sound and Scott Keevan's beautiful lighting, it was, it was, the effect was achieved. I thought that this was a scene for women. This was a scene where women could hear their dates screaming and think, yeah, that's, uh, that's a funny one. Who is this behind me? Oh my God! The hermit, the hermit is the scariest part of the movie. Ari Verveen. He's a method actor, and that guy, God bless him, he stood out there in the freezing cold, and we lit him on fire, and he actually really wanted to be lit on fire. Well, they're gonna take me out there, and they're gonna slap me around a little bit, and uh, bang, bang me up. <laughs> and then they're gonna set me on fire. Hey, it's on the day's work, you know. Okay, I'm just putting it on the, the parts of the skin that are exposed. Is that right? Does that burn? Great job. Jordan does have that soft touch, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you a craft fiend? I do decoupage. Oh, yeah. And I make soap sometimes. Oh, wow. Well, you like, oh, we got that nipple shot you were talking about. Oh, I knew I had the nipple shot. Yeah, you like that? He's the most beautiful. Oh, permit. That's the worst. <laughs> no. Y'all are the best for Great. He shot me. And he really, I think, added a wonderful layer of sympathy and, and resonance to that character who essentially just gets rotted and burnt to a crisp. The dog is a menacing part of the movie and it, he's a recurrent character and you know he's he's after the kids he's after these rotting away kids and he wants a piece of that and he has to be menacing and he has to be a presence and he has to be scary. We first started out uh, we had a different dog in Cabin Fever which we had to cut uh, named Jake the dog, the black dog, the dog that played the black dog in the black dog with Patrick Swayze. That puts me like two degrees from Swayze, I, I gotta get this dog. So I didn't watch a tape or see a picture of the dog, which was a big mistake. So cheer up, things will get better. It's gonna be slow. Say how is the weather, let's fly on a cloud together. We got a happy little dog that all he wanted to do was wag and, and pant and, and lick. Mm -hmm. 
The dog is too fat, too old, it's arthritic. Let's start walking today. And your dog didn't do shit. Not even not even hold on to a damn stick. Jake, grab. Come on, grab. Stay. Grab. I mean, I think you got some pieces that artistically, if if you really work on it, you might come up with maybe two seconds of something. <laughs> this is a big problem. We shot a whole day and had um, something that just wasn't, didn't scare me at all. And I couldn't, I knew it would haunt, I haunt the production. And I didn't care what it took. We had to find another dog. And in this sort of, um, emotional mindset of mine, I think I might have gone a little overboard in getting a dog um, that was, uh, where no actors could be around. He was that menacing. That's cut. Anything I can do to better it, just stay alive. <laughs> and that was beautiful, buddy. The trainers were fantastic, and, and we just made sure that there was an actor in the scene with the dog at the same time. We are in Bronson Canyon near the famous Bronson Caves, where many, many, many a scene from a Hollywood and TV show has been filmed. Garrett's giving me a dirt job right now, and it's very exciting. I mean, are they physically going to throw us out? Oh my god. Right in, in there. Let's go, let's go, let's roll it. Let's roll camera, guys. Oh, cut. <laughs> <laughs> so where should I go? Should I pass? Well, very, or should I very here? funny. <laughs> Everyone gave me shit about the deer head. People were saying, this is, we're not making Tommy Boy. This has got to look good. And I said, no, you don't understand. It's an hour and 20 minutes into the movie. If people's asses are still on the seats, they don't give a fuck what it looks like. Give it just a little, just a few frames that I can cut out. The cane bee had the best deer. They had a huge <laughs> mechanical torso deer that we used for the initial head. And then we had leg hooks just for like stomping and stomping and stomping. Okay, good, 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 good. That's what we're going to do. Now, let's get some blood squirt going. That is one of my absolute favorite scenes. Finally, watching it with an audience, and people were just like laughing and yelling. It's so ridiculous and disgusting that people are, I think at that point, people are along with the ride and they're kind of forgiving. In movies like Phantasm and like 70s horror movies, they're always like, yeah, man, we're gonna go to a party. And it's like always like really lame parties. Like people just out in the woods, like standing around doing nothing, drinking. <laughs> and like, this is like a 70s horror movie party. Here, have a big beer. Come on, drink up. Got some sexy hair, you know that? <laughs> Winston loves to party. And the worst thing that could ever happen is if the party is broken up. And the fucking gun's in the car, man. I just wanna get into town. Get away from you! Fucking fruitcake! Cut! Got your cut! Very cut. good! What did I do to deserve all this attention? <laughs> I, 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 
me on my asset. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You just fucked up the whole party, you fucking idiot! Cut. Check it. That could not be more perfect. At the script stage, we kept saying, this is going to be a theatrical film. Everybody's going to flip over this. And, and, and in fact, everyone in the industry had passed on the script. Out of 343 films, Cabin Fever was the final movie of the festival. And a lot of people go home and don't stay for the whole festival, but people were staying for Cabin Fever. Two days before we were supposed to screen at the Toronto Film Festival, we only had three reels in the movie. And literally, the print was finished, gave it to her, she took it on a plane. I grabbed like a bunch of promotional flyers, we got on a plane, went right to the press and industry screening. They wouldn't let me in, there was a line around the, the, the block. Ten minutes of the movie, people get up and they start leaving. And I was like, what the hell's going on? Well, it turned out they were bidding on the movie. That night, they had a screening in a thousand seat theater. And the people lined up around the corner at midnight, in the rain. It was, it was unbelievable. Everybody was cheering, screaming, um, you know, having a genuinely good time. Every single company that told me they would never make this movie or give us money for this movie, yesterday were slugging it out for a bidding war. <laughs> and I'm so excited to announce here, the first time you guys all get to know that we signed a deal with Lionsgate that picked the movie for this movie. Toronto was a dream come true. Well, the success of Cabin Fever has finally allowed me to pay off my bookie and my, my drug dealer and you know, pay the child support to my four wives that my current wife doesn't know about. So that, that's really what's most important to me about the picture, that uh, all the money I made. I, I, don't, I don't give a crap if it's artistically good. I feel like I'm making a porno. Thanks for watching our documentary. Hope you've learned a little something and had fun in the process. I'm Eli Roth. Yeah, guys, can we shut up for a second? Ta-da! Hey everybody, we're making a movie, we're making movies, everybody's happy. We're making movies, we're making movies, it's a little cold out. Nobody here likes the fact that there's no girls around.